Welcome to Why Data Protection for Office 365 is Critical. This webinar is sponsored by Asigra, where recovery is everything. The premise of this webinar is that Office 365 has become the essential cloud application for the vast majority of our organizations today. But here's the issue. Most users of Office 365 fail to protect their Office 365 data. We're going to cover a lot today. We're going to talk about why Office 365 has become so important and what it is, and why Office 365 data protection is mission critical. Some of the pervasive Office 365 data protection myths, the risks, the consequences, and the costs of not protecting Office 365, and core considerations that you should think about when protecting Office 365 data, and then we'll go over some best practices and Q&A. So with that, I'm going to start with introductions. I'm your moderator. My name is Mark Stamer. I'm the President and Chief Dragon Slayer of Dragon Slayer Consulting. We have a great schedule of panelists today. I'm going to let them introduce themselves. I'll start with you, Chad. Hi, uh, hi Mark and uh, attendees. I'm Chad Whaley, CEO and co-founder of Echopath. Uh, we are based in Indianapolis, Indiana. Uh, which is in the Midwest United States. We are an IT managed services company that focuses on data backup, disaster recovery, and strategic hosting solutions. We've been in a Segra partner for over five years, and uh, we have been highly engaged with the Segra promoting Office 365 protection since uh, they released it back in February of 2015. James? Yeah, hi Mark. My name is James Chilman. I'm the Managing Director here at UK Backup uh, over in the United Kingdom. We are a Cloud Backup and Disaster Recovery Specialist uh, using the Asegra products. We specialize in everything from the public sector through to not-for-profit and the private sector uh, with a real focus on Office 365. And Jesse? Hello everyone. Jesse Maldonado, Director of Project Services for Center Technologies, organization based in Houston, Texas. Um, we essentially cover the gamut of professional services all the way down to manage and hosted services. We've been a, a secret partner for coming up on three years. Well, thank you, gentlemen. This is going to be a good webinar. I expect lots of interesting information to come from all of you. All right, so let's start with what is Office 365. As you can see from the slide, it's a lot. It's everything you're used to on your desktop, on your laptops, on your tablets. It's covers almost every uh, productivity application that Microsoft brings to the table today. And more and more people are using it. Everything from video conferencing to just email and Office Docs. Why has it become so important? Well, let's look at the numbers. It's got the largest market share at this point of anyone. It's got more than 25% of the market and it's dominating Google Business Apps and Salesforce. Every single month more than 50,000 small to medium business sized companies are signing up and it continues to grow at a pretty steady and consistent growth. It's a focus for Microsoft. They had nearly 80% year over year growth from 2015 to 2016 and it's tightly integrated with Office 2016 and Windows 10 so most people are getting into Office 365 today. Now why is it data protection of this mission critical? Well, it's where data is living now. It's where it's going. It's going into the Microsoft Azure Cloud with Office 365. Email, unstructured data, ubiquitous access from a variety of devices, laptops, tablets, smartphones. It's the number one cloud-based business productivity application, as I said. And with large companies, it has even greater market share than even with small companies. But having said all that, how do we know? that this is growing so fast. Well, there's a company out there called Okta. Okta actually manages the business user passwords in the cloud, and they've been tracking the number of passwords in each application in the cloud, and the one that's growing by far the fastest of any of them and has the largest market share today, Office 365. This is versus every single cloud application out there. Now, there are a lot of myths about Office 365 data protection a lot of them, and I'm going to open it up to the panel now and saying based on these myths, the ones that you see here, like Office 365 being automatically protected, what are the ones that you run across the most? And I'm going to direct that one at James to start off. Yeah, thanks, Mark. So one of the, the things we see quite often when we're engaged with potential clients talking about Office 365 data protection 
is the understanding of the responsibilities of the data. Uh, we see they do a lot of impact uh, risk security and compliance analysis on putting their data in Office 365, but they don't really have the awareness of who is responsible for the data. Now, Microsoft are responsible for running the service. That's fantastic. They do a great job, and they're not going to destroy your data. But the end user is still responsible for managing and protecting that data from anything from accidental or malicious behavior all the way through to the likes of ransomware. Um, so it's, you've really got to make sure you understand who is responsible for that data and where your responsibilities lie. What do you think, Jesse? Which one of these do you run across a lot? I think it's um, a lot of what we run into is that the you know 365 data is not mission critical, um, and that 365 will always be available. My data is safe, and the perception that now that I've offloaded my data to the cloud or to 365 that it's protected, it's someone else's problem. We certainly see a lot of that, which is obviously not the case. What are your thoughts, Chad? Well, I would concur with uh, my other panelists uh, on people underestimating the importance of protecting their Office 365 data because they feel that it's somehow protected properly by Office 365. Uh, the second thing I would point out is, you know, there's some additional things that come into concern when they're moving that data there and, and how to manage that data over time uh, that people overlook, um, which I think is also, uh, it, it kind of ties back to a myth of about general savings that they have. And what is that myth about general savings that they have? Well, I think, you know, people kind of are lured to Office 365 uh, due to financial savings, but they don't truly factor in all the costs associated with it. What we see, it's more of a shift in cost and how they're spending. You know, factor in things such as how are we going to protect that data once it's there. You know, they are spending that money on site when it's on site, but they don't always factor that money in when they move to Office 365. Additionally, how are we going to manage that data uh, over the lifetime, uh, do we even need to manage it, which I would agree they do, and they, they overlook that commonly, and therefore don't factor it into their total cost. What are some of the risks and consequences and costs of unprotected Office 365? And I'll start with you, Jesse. What are some of the risks that you see out there? So the risk that we've seen is just the, the you know, a Word document turns up missing and it's, you know, has to be recreated from the ground up. A few hours of lost productivity. We've obviously had stories of businesses, you know, reputation affected and businesses, you know, completely being, you know, put out of business because of that loss of data. They just were never able to recover from it. James? What are some of the consequences? So the risk, yes, exactly. So the risks behind it, you know, there's a huge number of risks that we're exposed to by still using the cloud systems. Uh, we can still be susceptible to the likes of ransomware. Obviously, the consequences of getting ransomware on, even if the server's locally, are huge. You know, we're talking about downtime to your business potentially, uh, loss of earnings, uh, and potentially fines for breaching data protection laws. So there's a huge number of consequences and costs associated with that. James, you brought up ransomware a couple times now. Do you want to explain to the audience exactly what you mean by that and what kind of growth have you seen in ransomware attacks? Yeah, exactly. So I think there's some misconception that moving your data to the likes of Office 365 or in the cloud uh, protects you from the likes of ransomware, which is, is, is not the case, unfortunately. Um, you know, with OneDrive for Business, you're syncing files from your desktop daily. Uh, it's still very easy for a ransomware to spread with an Office 365. They do their best to protect the systems, but the ransomware is changing every day, and it's getting more and more advanced, so the risks are increasing. Uh, so there's huge risks out there from it. Uh, as a company, we are seeing a massive growth at the moment in restores for ransomware attacks, uh, and it's definitely sort of our main area of focus when it comes to getting our clients' data back at the moment. And Chad, what about you? Well, I, I think uh, I would approach this from, uh, you know, using some statistics to back this up. Um, I was uh, recently doing some research uh, from a study I was looking at back in 2013 that uh, said, you know, 50-55% of the disaster-related downtime was due to hardware failure. Well, by moving to the cloud, that obviously helps that piece in, in some cases. Uh, but, you know, let's be honest, there's still that potential cause of downtime. Uh, the other largest factors are human-related and also software-related downtime, you know, which uh, accounts for about 40% of downtime from this one study I was looking at. Well, by moving to Office 365, you are still 
um, you're still dealing with that. Human error uh, is still very prevalent. Um, software is still very prevalent. It's the same system that we're using in the cloud that we were using on-premise. So those same, same errors still occur. You know, you know, if you have uh, the proverbial Bob in accounting who deletes all, all of his data and doesn't realize it for 45 days, that's still an issue that you need to protect against in the cloud. So basically what you're all talking about, there's a high risk of data loss if you don't protect your data, whether it be from malware, whether it be from human stupidity, or whether it be from accidents, you have risk of data loss if you're not protecting your data. I, I get that. So yeah, I mean, uh, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, you know, another one is administrative. Uh, to date, our largest restore is, was due to an admin that didn't know how to use Office 365 properly, did some things that uh, purged some data uh, that we had to restore for the, his organization of about 1,000 users. Uh, you know, human error is still very, very uh, in the forefront here. And uh, we need to protect against that as much as we do everything else. People, uh, you know, obviously people typically think of natural disaster, uh, which typically accounts for only like five or six percent of the related downtime. So uh, it's the human error and the software error that we really need to protect against. Have any of you had to recover Office 365 data, like Exchange or or some of the Office Docs or any of the applications on the premise of your client versus or in your own cloud? versus recovering it in the Microsoft Cloud. And James, you? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, we, we've come across that problem a few times. Um, it, it's all good and well being able to put the file straight back to where it came from in the first place, but sometimes that's not the desired action. So sometimes we need to be able to take that file. Uh, perhaps it's for an audit reason or maybe a compliance reason. Uh, and we don't want to overwrite the existing one. We, we just want to take maybe an old version you know, from 30, 40 days ago and supply that to, to someone else so within the company. So that's a, it's a great thing to be able to do. And Chad, has that ever happened with your organization? Uh, yes, we have, we've often in the case of uh, when someone leaves the company, we often will restore data back into like a manager's mailbox so they have an archive of it. Or we've restored it often to a, you know, a local uh, version, uh, premise-based version, so they can audit it offline as well. So we've done both. Jesse? We've certainly seen it, not in the, the grand scale that my colleagues have seen, but we've certainly done those restores where we've needed to take the data from 365 and have a local copy of a, you know, standalone exchange server to, you know, further analyze data, purposes of, you know, individuals that have left organizations and things as such. Gotcha. All right, so now you've, you've established that you should protect your Office 365 data. What would be core considerations of people out there, clients, uh, users in general, when protecting Office 365 data? What would you recommend to them? And I'll start with you, James. So I guess we, we sort of work through a process with our clients when it gets to the core considerations. We, we try to get them to understand how the system works. You know, how does Office 365 work in terms of data protection? What are the core capabilities built into it? And then we look at addressing the gaps around it. Uh, we try and define some service level agreements with them. You know, how quickly can they get the content back? How easy is it? You know, if they need to restore a single file, how is that possible? Do they need to implement a different tool to make that possible? Um, also, you know, what are the recovery time objectives they need to be putting into place? Is it okay that they may have to go off and speak to Microsoft and find out they can't restore their data, or do they need to be able to get their data back within within the hour? Those are the, the main things that we work with. Chad, what about you? Well, building on what James said, I think you also need to look at what are your retention um, you know, policies for each type of data. Do you need the capability of having a different retention policy for managers exchange data versus maybe your plant workers? Do you need different retention periods for SharePoint data versus OneDrive data? Having a system that has that granularity capability uh, is, uh, is typically uh, very sought after. The other thing that I think is also key here is I hear from a lot of people they don't like share the SharePoint online versioning um, capability. So a lot of people want to be able to use granular schedules to back up data more frequently. 
uh, in order to kind of overcome some of the challenges they see with SharePoint's versioning online. And Jesse, what would you add to what James and Chad said? I think the, you know, what we see a lot of is organizations that don't have that, you know, standardized recovery time, recovery point objectives defined. Um, that Those two metrics drive a lot of what the protection policies and retention policies look like. So certainly knowing, you know, what's important to, to the organization, what compliance needs are there, and exploring those in depth. For example, financial and healthcare typically have much higher retention policies and, you know, they have much more strict guidelines around how fast and how often that data should be protected. So certainly dive in deep into that, without a doubt. So to summarize what you all just said, RPO requirements, RTO requirements, on-premise recoveries, in the cloud recoveries, versioning, retention rates, backup validation, certified data, all this stuff is kind of important from the things you, we've been discussing for the last few minutes. I get it. All right, so let's talk best practices. And I'm going to start with you, Jesse. What would be some of the best practices you would recommend when it comes to data protection of Office 365? So first and foremost is getting a handle on, you know, what those retention policies need to be. Um, a lot of times we find organizations that don't have those defined and we'll, we'll go in with a recommendation of, you know, let's, let's start with a, a very basic retention policy as we continue to dig deep. They might be as little as 30 days a month of retention. It might even be as, as you know, as high as 90 days out right out the gate. And in that time frame, we're able to establish a more defined, um, essentially a more defined retention policy and, you know, from a long-term perspective and, you know, is that going to be, you know, how many dailies, weeklies, monthlies, and so forth. And James? So I guess one of the, the, the best practices we would sort of try and implement is uh, the retention, uh, allowing, you know, making sure the users have the correct number of versions they're looking for. And also the, making sure that the solution they deploy has the capability to do more than just put the file back in its original location. That it's a great tool if, you know, if someone's deleted an email, but sometimes we need to go back maybe with a, a file in SharePoint, and we may be actually after the metadata, you know, who changed this file a month ago to make it into the current version, and that kind of thing. So we need to be able to make sure we can restore files back, either, you know, straight to your hard drive, perhaps a different account, a manager's account within the system, or even, you know, an on-premise system of Exchange or SharePoint, et cetera. Okay. And Chad, do you have anything to add to that? Well, not to point out the obvious, but I would think first and foremost, uh, you know, factor in what your data protection plan of Office 365 is going to be before you move there. Uh, too many people, it's an afterthought, and so I would want them to plan accordingly for that protection mechanism before they actually get data there. Second, spend a little time thinking about how your organization is going to deal with uh, the data of employees that leave your organization. You know, are you going to keep it in Office 365? Are you going to archive it somehow? You know, how are you going to deal with that data uh, 30, 60, 90 days after that employee's left? Uh, and, you know, and then obviously overlay any kind of compliance that your organization may have internally or externally uh, to those policies. So basically what I heard you all say was to plan, determine the organizational requirements. And one thing that's not up here, but... I, I heard a lot of this, flexibility and granularity are key aspects. Not one size fits all, even within the organization. Is, is that pretty much it, would you say, gentlemen? James? Yeah, it comes it up really well. Yeah, okay. All right, so what would you conclude? If you had to tell the audience today one, two, or three things, and you can pick how many you want to tell them, that you want them to walk away with and say, yeah, that's what I'm going to remember, what, what would that be? And I'm going to start with you, Chad that one size does not fit all of your data. In other words, you want something with some capability behind it, uh, not just uh, you know being able to protect the whole organization with one button. I think you need some of that granularity. James, what about you? Yeah, so um, Microsoft does a great job of protecting its customers' data from loss due to the infrastructure failures uh, and other environment and environmental issues. But make it very clear, it, it's your data. You own it and you control it. I think what, what you just said there was uh, you, you can't contractually de-obligate yourself or unobligate yourself to the responsibility of that data. Is that right? It, exactly. Whether it's on-premise or in the cloud, you are still in control of it. 
And Jesse, you want to wrap this up on what you would want them to walk away with? Absolutely. So from a, you know, I guess a tip, know your data. Know what you actually have, what's critical, what's not, who the, I guess the employees that are dealing with that sensitive or most sensitive areas of the environment. And then two, it's, it's again, the responsibility of data, whether it's on-prem or in the cloud, you're always responsible for. It, it never goes away. Well, thank you, gentlemen. What you see here on this slide is if you need more information about how to back up Office 365, there's a data sheet you can get at www.asegra.com forward slash solutions forward slash backup dash Microsoft dash Office dash 365. You can find out more by calling the numbers you see on the screen or sending an email, and you can even request a product demo. I want to thank our panel today. We're going to do some Q&A at this point. We have some questions that have come in from the audience. One of the first questions that has come in is, what about situations where the company has given a subpoena to provide communications with another ent uh, entity? How does a Seagra's recall compare to Microsoft's recall? And I'll put that, start with James on this one. So I guess the, the key thing is is you have access to your data at any point in time. The data is fully encrypted. Uh, as a client, you hold the encryption keys. Uh, it's your only you have the ability to unencrypt the data. It, it's not something we can provide to third parties, you know, straight out the bat. Uh, so that's the key takeaway from that one. And also, you have the ability to restore to several places. You can take a local copy to supply to a third party if needs be. Uh, you can restore it back to different systems. So, so that's sort of the capabilities within the system. And Jesse? I think to build upon that, the customer always owns that encryption key. And without it, there's nothing any provider is going to be able to do to recover it. And it's kind of the beauty of it. So that certainly if, if, that, uh, if we're kind of heading in the right direction on the same page with that, I would say you know, the question seems to be geared more around you know, the encryption and how data privacy pertains to the product. Sounds good. And Chad? Um, what, what would you say here? Well, when I hear that question, I think, uh, how is this user going to find the data that they're being subpoenaed or they're being asked for? And having the ability to search based on strings or sort of keywords, having that kind of capability uh, and, uh, and limiting it to the specific subpoena. I, you know, you want a solution that has that capability if, if you're expecting uh, to be in a situation where you're going to have to have an e-discovery. Well, gentlemen, we have a few more questions. One that's come in, this is, how well does your data protection scale? Can it scale to thousands of mailboxes globally, and at least 2,000 and even more? So, Chad, what do you say? Yes, the solution is very scalable. Uh, you know, we are capable of doing uh, multiples of thousands of, uh, of mailboxes and, you know, large amounts of data, both in SharePoint and OneDrive. And Jesse and James, do you have anything to add? I guess the only thing I would add is it, it's not a one-shoe-fits-all um, sort of bit of software. It, it's hugely customizable, uh, which makes it fantastic, whether it's just yourself or a two-user organization, all the way up to thousands of users. It's very flexible and very easy to customize to make sure it fits your data protection requirements. But to add to that, you're essentially adding hardware and scaling the solution out. Gotcha. Well, now that we're heading into the holiday season, we have a question from retail, which this is when they tend to have their peak employment. What is the best practice for handling mailboxes of transient workers who leave the organization after six months? We are a retailer who hires extra staff during the holidays, and then these employees leave the organization. How should we treat these mailboxes because we need to keep the data on record for a minimum of a year? And Jesse, let's start with you on this one. Essentially identifying those individuals and, and that, that part of the workforce, you know, very clearly defined, the retention policies within the product, the secret platform, allow for, you know, retention policy to be specific per user, per data store, so on and so forth. So certainly a policy be, can, can be created to follow those individual, you know, seasonal workers, so to speak, um, to ensure that the data is packed up long after they've left. Do you have anything to add, you know, gentlemen? Uh, James? No, J Jesse nailed that one perfectly. 
Okay. Uh, the only thing I would say is having that capability to get it out of Office 365 in entirely if so you're not continuing to pay for those users' license once they have transitioned off. You know, having a system that you could archive that data in offline uh, as well you know, is, is another key thing there, I think, to that question. Okay. And another question from the audience. We have users that forget to back up their mailboxes. What do you do to automate that on a daily basis? So I'll open that up to James on this one. So the Asegra solution is, is completely automated. We work off schedules. Um, you can run the schedules uh, as frequent as you need them to run. So the system is basically hands-free from your user's point of view. They don't have to have any direct, uh, they don't have to take any physical action to actually make sure the backups run. It all runs quietly in the background with the users uh, blissfully unaware. Another question, how long can you keep the data in Office 365 with the secret software. What is the maximum length of time? And Chad, let's let's go to you on that one. It's totally customizable. Uh, it's on a user by user or even on a backup set by backup set basis. So if your organization needs to keep things for 100 years, you can make that happen. Uh, if you only need to keep it for one year, that also can happen, and that could that retention policy could be different for say their SharePoint data than their Exchange data, or it could be different for their managers versus maybe their you know factory workers. And I have one more question from the audience, and that's about all the time we have anyway. How does your solution support Office 365 Exchange Online, SharePoint Online, and OneDrive? And you've been talking about this, so I'll, I'll just leave it to you Jesse you want to close out with this question so essentially there's a you know a, a, a centralized component that, that manages all that very similar to the on-prem components of the Seagra um, it, it's it, it's essentially a built-in component for the software I mean it's you know it, it grabs onto I guess back-end API that's available to do that it logs in and does the same across all three of those technologies those are a fantastic job well, perfect. Well, gentlemen, I want to thank you. You guys did a great job. You gave us good information. If you want more information about today, we're going to go back to this screen for you, and you can see where you can go online to find out more information. There are phone calls you can make. There are emails you can send. You can, as I said, ask for a demo at any time. I want to thank the audience for attending. This was a lot of fun, and have a great day, everyone.